Before we continue, understand this podcast is for adults only and refers to relationships and activities between adults, which are voluntary and consensual. If you or anyone you know is being abused, coerced, or violently aggressed against, please reach out for help to the appropriate authorities. Episode 20, Tao of Gore. Happy Sunday to you all, and thanks for joining me again this weekend. Today, I'm going to explore one strategy by which people on Earth may voluntarily choose to relate to each other in a Gorian fashion. This initially takes over only the areas in which people related to each other in strictly or mostly online settings, but over time, could be expanded to the point that it becomes the codes and even the laws that people live by. This episode pulls very little from the books. Although John Norman had an excellent mind for science fiction, the very concept of blockchain hadn't occurred to him or to any of his fellow authors from the 1990s in the before the 1990s in the form of a concept called hashcash. As such, please indulge me while I read to you a posting I wrote a few years ago on the Gorian Gathering Place group on FetLife.com. D-A-O of Gore Tao of Gore Confucius say men fight with steel, women smile and kneel. No, not Taoism, and Taoism, though it has much to recommend it. I'm referring to DAOs, which is an initialing, uh, an acronym for something called a Decentralized Autonomous Organization. So for an introduction, DAOs have been around, in theory, for at least a quarter century, but their practical implementation has been much easier lately due to blockchain slash distributed letter ledger technologies. Now before I get into how such a tool may be used by Gorians here on Earth, let me talk about the wizard. Surely everyone has read some book or watched some film or play or cartoon wherein a wizard casts a spell. Quote, when the castle is rebuilt, the bravest son of Warhaven shall command all the creatures of the nearby forest and shall be king of Warhaven. Now, the wizard can die, can become senile, he can retire, he can move to a new locale, but the spell still works. The wizard doesn't need to personally administer the spell like the executor of a will or a court bailiff. It will be executed by the universe itself upon certain conditions being met. The wizard cannot be bribed or coerced by a rival claimant to the throne to change the spell once cast. He has essentially instantiated a new law of physics. The wizard in speaking the spell, has written a new line into the source code of reality. So if a thousand years later, the castle is rebuilt by a tycoon in a modern city, some young man with a courageous streak will find a crown appearing on his head and the various raccoons, rats, squirrels, and coyotes of the city bound to his will. Now, DAOs at present do not interact directly with physical reality. There are two intermediaries of interest which may bridge some of the gap. NFTs and smart contracts. An NFT is a non-fungible token, a piece of information which can be transferred from one owner to another, but, thanks to modern cryptographic techniques and distributed ledger technology, 
cannot be owned by two owners at one time. It exists as a unique token, whose value may be entirely self-contained, such as in the case of a digital piece of artwork, or it may correspond to some real-world counterpart, such as a unique physical object. Different NFTs can be set up in different ways, whereby a curious third party may be able to view information about who owns the NFT, the last, the last purchase price, what the NFT contains, or this information may be private, or the privilege of viewing the information may be given or sold, etc., by the NFT's owner. Now, a smart contract is a transaction that is completed upon another condition being fulfilled, with the code to execute the transaction being entirely contained within the contract. It may or may not expire, or the transacted value decrease or increase with time, depending on how the contract slash code is written. The contract executes itself. In both of the above cases, there is no human executor of the contract or custodian of the tokens. They are held entirely by their owners and, quote, stored in a digital ledger distributed across many computers working in different areas of the world. So, from bits to atoms, how do we get into the real world with this? Well, one example of an NFT system which may be of particular interest to Gorians would be a decentralized version of TSR slash SLRN. Um, TSR meant the slave register and SLRN meant slave registration number. Now, if I know my kinky internet history, TSR was something created by a man who goes by Thanos. He had quite an interesting website, and I particularly enjoyed reading his essays on a topic which he may have named internal enslavement. Understand that the following is not meant to be the least derisive towards Thanos, whoever or wherever he may be. If he has passed, may he rest in peace. So SLRN was administered by a person or a group of persons. The data is backed up in a few places, or it isn't. These present threats to the integrity and security of the concept, which diminishes the value proposition of a slave registry. By the way, what are the value propositions of a slave registry? Well, there's availability and notoriety. The information is in a place where anybody who knows how to look can see it. Something like a county records office for slaves. As such, some people place value on this information being viewable as a visible sign of commitment to a partner, or perhaps just as an aesthetic commitment to the MS lifestyle, or for myriad other purposes. There is just one SLRN, although there are a few knockoffs. Being on the largest, most widely adopted one has more value and prestige to most people than being on a registry which only has five members. Now there's also integrity and security. The information cannot be altered by someone other than the designated individual. So if Busty Blunt Kajira 69 username on FetLife registers as a slave with SLRN 12345678, then she and only she, can change the information on there as to who the owner is, whose collar she wears, etc. Unless, of course, she forgets her password and needs to contact customer service, who may or may not help her with various degrees of competence and being human, with varying degrees of impartiality with respect to their privileged position as administrator, knowing that the list cannot be easily altered makes it more real. There is also the matter of durability. The SLRN database has existed continuously for at least two decades, minus a data loss which occurred in 2017. As such, the fact that the data has remained around for so long and is reasonably secure makes it more real and valuable as well. This is well suited for demonstrating a longer-term commitment 
such as that of a committed relationship, or even a personal commitment to the ethos of slavery, ownership, mastery, service, etc. There is scarcity if BBK69, from above, had several SLRN registries, and if each registry showed a different owner, then each of those owners, and any future prospective owner, may feel justified in considering their own ownership claim to be worth rather less. In fact, with enough duplicate ownership claims, any one of them becomes quite worthless. Of course, some of these may just be duplicate accounts, to which BBK69 had long forgotten the password, and customer service may be able to clean up some of this mess. As fallible humans, they have no means at their, disposable, at their disposal to determine which is the true owner, other than the information provided by BBK69, or whichever ownership claimant contacted them. Now, many other value propositions exist within the SLRN, and to some people, some of the value propositions listed above may actually be liabilities. For example, if BBK69 is extremely promiscuous, which for the purpose of discussing value propositions I will neither condone nor condemn, she may regard the scarcity value as a liability, as it work as it would work against her preference for multiple partners. The integrity may be a liability to an individual whose sense of identity is very fluid, and the security may be a liability to someone who doesn't have a good system for remembering or recording passwords or private keys. Now, consider an alternative to the SLRN, which takes the form of a system of non-fungible tokens on its own blockchain. The, NFT, the NFTs themselves can be expensive or nearly free. The NFTs can also have some features which are extremely low in cost and others which may be purchased. This purchase takes the form of a social proof of stake, but is actually accomplished by paying proof of storage and proof of work miners to store, secure, and verify. Would an SLRN type unique token be more desirable if it needed to be purchased? If we take MF slavery, that's male slash male owner slash female slave slavery as normative, a man who is willing to stake in, i.e. purchase the NFT on his slave or or prospect's behalf may be regarded as generous. One who purchases several empty NFTs without slaves to fill them may be regarded as desperate. A little bit like a man who buys lingerie for his real dolls. Of course, at every level people have different values associated with an outlay of value. It could be that the real doll enthusiast takes some satisfaction in endowing his, quote, girls with something of value. The parameters of the NFT can be different on different blockchains or customizable per NFT? Can the NFT be traded to another owner? That depends if you want to set it up that way. Let's say that Busty Blonde Kajira 69's NFT is paid for by her master, King Dom 1980. It contains various images, text, etc. associated with BBK 69's identity, and perhaps a blurb in the owner's section by KD1980, which talks about how wonderful a slave girl she is, etc. Now, scenario A. The NFT can be traded openly with only the owner's private keys. This means that at any time, at his sole discretion, KD1980 may sell the NFT to someone else for any price by using his private key. He could set this up as a smart contract, meaning that ownership of the NFT is transferred automatically upon the completion of another crypto transaction specified in the smart contract. Or he may sell it offline by any method of currency, trade, or barter, and at that moment transfer the NFT manually with the new owner's address. So, the advantages to Scenario A, which we'll call playing for keeps, Scenario A may be attractive to an extremely committed couple, whose confidence in their bond is so high that the slave is willing to have her master hold all the cards. 
because she knows he won't sell her or trade her against her will. In theory, scenario A would also be attractive to a hypothetical Kajira who is extremely committed to Gorian slavery, at least in terms of the transactional aspects of ownership. Now, disadvantages to playing for keeps. While relationships break down, a keyholder can die intestate. Um, intestate means without a will although the meaning of which I suspect will come more and more to mean that he took his passwords to the grave rather than his will. A keyholder could become unreasonable, incapacitated, or could otherwise use the NFT to exert dominance of a sort that was never agreed to by the slave. Again, such limitless power is a pro for some, a con for many. Consider the opposite, scenario B. The NFT is completely under BBK. A69's control. She may alter the owned by tag as often as she likes, regardless of what KD1980 wants. Essentially, the NFT becomes almost identical in function to a FetLife profile, the only difference being that it is hosted in a completely decentralized way and can only have one true owner at a time. Advantages are that under scenario B, if BBK69's tastes, ideas, or commitment level to her master KD1980 changes, she may change that as often as she likes for essentially zero cost. She isn't painting herself into any sort of corner at all, and she has complete digital freedom. The disadvantages are, of course, the same as the advantages. It just depends on who you are. Freedom may not be BBK69's preferred state. In fact, I would argue that freedom goes somewhat against her grain if her username is Busty Blonde Kajira 69 Fortunately, there is an infinite continuum of NFT ownership arrangements in between scenarios A and B. Scenarios A concern about the master dying could be resolved by KD 1980 needing to enter his private keys at fixed intervals, say every six months or so, or BBK69 status reverts to unowned. This may be a little pain in the rear to do, but it takes a few seconds, and can be a nice little reminder of the length of the relationship. BBK69 and KD1980 could even incorporate this as a renewal of vows of sorts every six months and rededicate themselves to each other. Upon KD1980's death, if she really were as committed as her NFT status would indicate, she could stand to wear black for a few months until the NFT reverts back to unowned. Scenario A could also be easily modified by a multi-signature smart contract that goes as follows. BBK69 may request an ownership change, which KD1980 may grant or refuse. If the request is revoked before it's granted, no change, though a record is kept, or not, depending on how the NFT is set up. The ownership change, if granted, is effective immediately. The ownership change, if refused, is granted automatically after three months, or automatically after five days if a certain specified cryptocurrency transaction has taken place. Which basically means that BBK69 could buy her freedom, or have somebody buy her freedom on her behalf. Any of these numbers can be varied to suit the individual's preferences and desires, and they are administered, that is, enforced entirely by code, with no central oversight, control, or authority. Take the above example. BBK69 and KD1980 might find it desirable to set up her NFT such that she may beg release, which will be automatically granted if KD1980 is paid a ridiculous Dr. Evil sum of cryptocurrency. Of course, this sum can be set arbitrarily and impractically high so that it could never be executed, but such a number could serve as some measure of the worth of the relationship. Of course, to some people, setting this number very high, but still in the possible range, might be more meaningful. If BBK69 really wants to show and feel that she is happily, but genuinely KD1980's property, she could set up, they could set up her NFT as follows. If she, beg, if she begs release, and she, 
or someone with tremendous resources comes up with 100k in crypto for KD1980, her release is granted immediately. The smart contract could specify that the NFT's new owner is the same as the person who paid, or that it reverts to her ownership. Will some do-gooder emancipator pay to free BBK69 if she bats her lashes at him so she can have her NFT's freedom back? Or will he only pay up if he gets to be the new owner of it? If KD1980 and BBK69 likes to have it known that she's his property, but only until someone coughs up a hundred trillion, that's a cute gesture. If the number is 50 bucks, the NFT isn't really worth anything, and perhaps the relationship isn't either. If the number is a hundred thousand, KD1980 may just tug BBK69's leash towards another route when walking to avoid the Ferrari drivers of Seattle meetup group. Which is better? It's entirely up to the people involved, and it depends how close to the edge one wants to live, skate, or play. So what exactly is inside the NFT? What is contained in it that makes it so valuable? How may the contents be inspected? Who has access to them? As above, with how the NFTs may be traded, so below, we will look at the extremes. Scenario A. BBK69's NFT contains real names, scans of valid government-issued ID, compromising blackmail-type photos, photos of the person's legal signature, banking passwords, crypto keys, close-up photos of her Kef brand, her Dina tattoo, medical information, allergy information, her real address, her phone number, her email addresses, and healthcare insurance papers. Basically, it contains everything that an identity thief or stalker could possibly want, so they could drain her bank account, take all of her crypto, and visit her in real life and put sesame seeds in her food to make her ill. All this information is online in a decentralized, can-never-be-deleted sort of way, and can be looked at by anyone at any time who has internet access. So the extreme scenario A is a bad idea, I would advise against it. Scenario B. BBK69's NFT is a gray silhouette with a cartoon question mark that says only her username and that she belongs to KD1980. Scenario B is basically useless and worthless, so consider something in between. BBK's NFT contains various media, as listed in Scenario A, but most of it is hidden from anyone but herself and the owner, in this case, KD1980. She may update some of the media, from time to time, but the update only takes effect after it is approved by KD1980, and he may choose to retain the original store in the NFC if he desires. He may, of course, download and share the images slash video himself off-chain, but he can do that anyway if he's got access to her images. Um, he may grant certain permissions to view certain parts of the NFT to certain other persons she may be allowed to do the sum of the same. The NFT may specify certain details about their relationship and keep others private, and some aspects of the NFT may be visible only after they are approved by the owner and the subject of the NFT using multisigs. Private galleries can be accessed by people who are given unique private keys by the owner or who, or who with a smart contract purchase access um, pay for the privilege of viewing those private galleries. This is to only fans what sharecropping is to farming, but you make up your mind if the farming is pre- or post-Civil War. Imagine the following scenario, where BBK69's NFT is owned by KD1980. The NFT is publicly visible on the blockchain as follows. Busty Blonde Kajira 69 the username, and a profile photo, nothing too racy, identifying or not, along with a little blurb. I, Busty Blanca 69, am an owned slave girl, happily serving Kingdom 1980 since 2008. I have had his steel locked around my throat since October 21st, 2008. I'm not allowed outside of our house after noon without three-inch heels, unless there is snow on the ground. If anyone sees me violating this rule, please take a picture and submit it to my master via this link. What? What was that? 
something about high heels and taking pictures? Yeah, it's offering a bounty. So someone takes a picture of BBK69 violating her master's orders not to be caught outside afternoon without three-inch heels on. This person submits the photo via the link. He attaches his crypto address, or his pseudo-Gorian NFT identity in some way. The picture arrives. KD1980 may accept it or reject it as evidence. If he, accept it, if he accepts it, he pays some agreed-upon bounty to the photographer. The bounty actually comes out of BBK69's crypto. Before the picture is sent to her, her master KD1980 might ask her, Did you break any of my rules today? Knowing full well that she did, if she cops to it, begs forgiveness, etc., then he may have set it, he may have set it up that he pays more of the bounty rather than her. If she writes a little poem in which she confesses her misadventure, and the poem is posted to her NFT such that she can't take it down for X days, or until KD1980 allows it, then her portion may be a little less still. A smart contract could also deduct a randomized amount from her and send it to him upon the mutual acceptance of a violation. Even if the randomization were weighted logarithmically towards smaller numbers, i.e. a fine of a dollar was ten or a thousand times more likely than one of ten dollars, the sting could be very real, yet very much still on-chain and administered by no one. These are all on-chain consequences. And of course, as her master, he may oppose additional consequences, you know, in the real world. There is a reputational aspect to this. Katie1980's online presence may have an indication as to what percentage of, quote, photos of my wench breaking my rules, unquote, bounties he pays, and how fast he pays them. This reputational component can add to or subtract from one standing in a community especially a Gorian community or an online community. The photographer above can have a reputational aspect as well to his online presence. What percentage of his, quote, rule-breaking wench photos are junk, phony, fake, or of poor quality? This number can, again, act as a certain proxy for his integrity, honor, etc., and can be displayed publicly or privately as one wishes, kind of like a credit score. Now, the meat of the issue, number three, alternative polities. So, community enforcement of some sort of alternative lifestyle rules may seem like a pretty thin premise. Or is it? Consider two real-world examples which have each attracted our attention in the Western world. One is a technologically advanced totalitarian state. Committed to equality in name, this mechanism creates a caste system that makes the Indian Brahmin to untouchable spectrum look like a schoolyard game. I'm talking about the People's Republic of China. Every citizen, though the term subject might be more accurate, is kept track of in myriad ways thanks to the integration of traceable transactions, mobile phones, surveillance, and good old-fashioned state terror. This results in social credit scores, and if this person's score falls low enough, he is no longer eligible for certain jobs. If it drops still lower, he's on a no-fly list. And if it drops even lower, he could be forbidden from using public transit. He is essentially codified as a pariah. Merely accessing this post may constitute an offense, which justifies the lowering of one's score. Now, the PRC's social credit system may have several upsides. It probably causes people to hide and then quit their more deleterious habits such as smoking, which is apparently a score-lowering offense. Its biggest downside, I must say, is that it appears to be compulsory and there's no right to exit. The right to exit I regard as much more important as even the right to vote. In the Sovietsky Soyuz and Eastern Bloc, people had votes. They just couldn't leave. None too different from the DPRK. This system facilitates an extremely powerful entity, the state, compelling one who is nearly powerless. No aspect of this is voluntary, and nobody has the right to exit. So I give this system a solid 0 0.07 stars. Let's look at another community-based enforcement mechanism. 
one which operates among religious and cultural minority groups in the Western world. Consider religious courts in a Western context, whether it's the Council of Elders in Utah, a Sharia court in Michigan, or a rabbinical court in New York. All of these entities have very limited recognition from the wider society's official court systems and usually are treated in a legal context as a pre-legal arbitration system rather than an actual court. They do, however, have tremendous influence over their congregants. While such congregants do possess the right to exit, there is a cost to doing so. To most congregants, the cost is mostly social, but ostracism exerts a strong influence. I, however, don't regard this cost as their principal flaw. I regard both corruption and, most importantly, the means by which people enter as their flaws. The road to exiting such a system may be a little bumpy, but most people in the West who enter such a system don't do so as adults. They are groomed from an early age to accept the legitimacy of this pseudo-polity based not on its own merits, which may or may not be excellent, but based on subordination to a cosmology or philosophy that its administrators are associated with. Of course, it hasn't escaped my attention that conventional polities operate much in the same way, that their ubiquity is counted as salutary, and most importantly, that children aren't really offered an alternative. So the points against religious courts, though, aren't really my concern here. I'm concerned with the fact that they do seem to succeed. Essentially, a minority of people in a given area is able to abide by a parallel, usually much stricter, moral code, which they find more meaningful or more genuine than that offered by the larger society that they inhabit. Is this starting to ring a little more true? They seem to get the job done. They're a little heavier on the god stuff than my personal preference, but it wouldn't surprise me if they get better numbers than society at large, such as higher marriage rates, lower divorce rates, fewer illegitimate children, less alcoholism, less tobacco-related illness, and most importantly, fewer women speaking out of turn. Go ahead, ask me if I'm joking about that last one. So I give religious courts and tribunals in non-theocratic states a solid 3.14 stars. Now four, a Tao of Gore, not the Tao of Gore. Consider then how exactly such a Tao would operate. Would it be free, cheap, or costly? Could one's status be statutorily declared? Or would a blockchain oracle need to pronounce it? I'm sorry, I, I guess I should define oracle. An oracle is a means, usually involving some sort of crowdsourcing, although getting more and more depending on AI, by which some state of the world may be, um, by which a blockchain may learn of some state of the world. So what is the current stock price of such and such? The blockchain may inquire about that fact um, by means of an oracle. Um, so could one status be statutorily declared? Or would a blockchain oracle need to pronounce it? Or could it be purchased on the basis of staking in? Just how severe are the bylaws, and what are the consequences for breaking from them? How, by the book, would this DAO attempt to be? What adaptations for reality are necessary, or practical, or desired? What is the place for costs, if any? How is the Homestone NFT going to be administered? The answer to all of the last paragraph's questions is, of course, exactly however you want. What I mean by this is that any number of Gorian-themed DAOs can be set up for very little cost. Nearly every variable as listed above can be tweaked with infinite variation. Let a hundred flowers bloom and see which ones attract the honeybees. Consider why you're in this message board group and not another. This one is better than the others, of course. But even our magnanimous host has to admit that this posting group is not as good as it could be. In a way, he has already recognized the limitations of this platform by somewhat migrating over to Discord. So consider below my personal bugbear of organizations, decentralized or otherwise. Though I regard the right to exit as supreme, 
and DAOs natively support such a thing, how is this dealt with in terms of someone who has volunteered to become someone else's property? Perhaps there is nothing a DAO can do to compel one to live by their commitments. However, a DAO can exert plenty of soft pressure, and as reputation can be a major DAO currency, perhaps a DAO that is technically easy to leave but hard to join could derive some of its prestige from a policy which doesn't allow people to join again after leaving. Think of it as a ledger-enforced version of a policy many online spaces have of banning sock puppet accounts. What kind of decentralized autonomous Gorian organization, a Dago, would you like to be a member of? One where the slave women need to provide verified body weight measurements to the ounce? One where any man identifying himself as a warrior or rider must show that he, A, owns a motorcycle in excess of 900 cc's, and B, is licensed to ride it in his jurisdiction? One where people need to stake in to the tune of 100,000 US dollars in order to buy us into some groovy commune grounds from washed up hippies in Arizona? How about a DAO that produces hard plastic identification cards so you can finally be a card carrying Gorian? Does your DAO of choice maintain Gorian philosophy as a normative notion that ought to pervade most, if not all, of one's life choices? Or does your DAO prefer to keep your Gorian side neatly bound within a play or roleplay context, never to interfere or contradict your normal life? The choice is yours. Found one you like, but you want to add something? You can contact the developers, or fork it off yourself, or just import the source code as a starting place. A Gorian DAO may seem like an exercise in obsession akin to a pair of six-year-olds drafting a 600-page constitution for their tree fort based He-Man Woman Haters Club, of which there are only two members. I suspect there is a genuine demand, though. Living some version of Gore is a relational enterprise. I think that the protocols observed in fora such as these, and in IRC chat rooms of yore, and the discord of today are evidence of this. I know people have mixed feelings about role-play environments, virtual or otherwise, but the very fact that they exist is testament to people's desire to live Gorian in relation to others, and to hold themselves to a Gorian standard in much more of their lives than just when they're logged in. To those who identify strongly with the cast of scribes, or the cast of lawyers, or the cast of blockchain developers, fertile grounds await your deft hand. Just understand that if your DAO sets you up as the supreme lord of the universe, you may not have as many takers as another DAO which is a little more genuinely decentralized. Now there are downsides, of course. The wrong DAO setup, or the right DAO setup for people who want to play closer to the bone, can facilitate all the worst sides of gore. It can help with genuine oppression, financial blackmail, revenge porn, human trafficking, cult building, etc. Now these things will happen anyways, just as how blockchain has made more than a few criminal enterprises more efficient. How many times have you heard from authorities that Bitcoin must be stopped regulated? It's being used by drug dealers, organized crime, terrorist organizations. It's absolutely true. But terrorists are going to terror. And they'll use the most efficient tools to do so. All of the above deleterious social arrangements are going to happen anyhow. The worst people will find the best tools. However, as with Bitcoin, I believe that the emancipatory power of blockchain will make far more people's lives better than worse. I would not have snuffed out the Polynesians first sale even for knowing about piracy, the horrors of naval warfare, and the crimes of naval empire. Many more people drowned than before, but many, many more have prospered. Well, that was the end of the post. As you can tell, I presented a very limited use case for a Gorian-themed DAO. In fact, it really is just a few customized NFTs, which though such a collective of NFTs technically meets the definition of a DAO, it barely scratches the surface of what a DAO may achieve. Take, for instance, the Bitcoin blockchain. Technically, it is a DAO. For the price of X Bitcoin, 
Anybody may write to the ledger any amount up to X Bitcoin into any public address that they choose. That's all it does. That the Bitcoin blockchain really only does one thing, that is, it keeps track of which wallet addresses have sent which quantity of Bitcoin to which other wallet addresses, is not to disparage it. It does so much more openly and honestly than do fiat currencies, such as dollars, etc. The fact that it is open, honest, and secure is itself a value proposition that seems to be worth, well, as of this moment, about 62,000 USD per coin, or somewhere in the range of 1.2 trillion, trillion USD total trading volume. I guess people are exactly that hungry for honest money. If you're listening to this in the future, US dollars were a silly thing that people used to use for commerce, and even everyday purchases before people widely understood cryptocurrency. It was weird back then, in 2024, governments would print money at will, and nobody knew how much their dollars would deflate to by the end of the week. The entire world was wrapped up in short-term, inflationary thinking, and only the wealthy could acquire assets and save for the future at a faster rate than inflation. Back to the present. What would a more comprehensive, Gorian-themed DAO look like? I was genuinely fishing about for ideas when I wrote that post in 2021, but unfortunately the response in the forum wasn't precisely attuned to just how thoroughly I believe blockchain will sweep through the earth. The venture capitalist and futurist Balaji Srinivasan depicts the blockchain revolution as essentially taking over political systems from the ground up, starting by providing alternatives to services at a municipal level of such higher quality and efficiency that it displaces the official municipal system of school boards, parks boards, and city councils by making them redundant. I see a parallel in our own modern system of laws here, how there are still a few dorks who try to invoke ancient legal customs or challenge people to duels or append Esquire to their legal name. Well, in each case, these approaches may be legal in some, on some paper somewhere, these people are generally regarded as a laughing stock. Medieval reenactors or otherwise are rendered pariahs. According to Mr. Srinivasan, the current crop of officials, including city councillors, school trustees, parks board members, and the host of other bureaucrats in the official system, they gradually become less and less relevant to the point that they are regarded in the same way that claimants to the French throne are today. Mr. Srinivasan bases this prediction on his belief that a voluntary, open-source, and honest system of self-executing smart contracts is much more efficient and less susceptible to bias, corruption, etc., garbage collection, water filtration, children's education, emergency services, etc., could all, according to him, be provided more efficiently, economically, and equitably in a decentralized, autonomous organization. There are other cases in which blockchain may present a much more functional alternative to current governing structures. This is particularly the case where local authorities are themselves rather more dysfunctional. They could be dysfunctional in a variety of ways. They could be corrupt. They could be weak and unstable. They could just be slow. They could be inaccessible to some large proportion of the population that they claim to govern. Or they could simply be incompetent. In much of the developing world, all five apply in generous amounts. Consider the case of some aspect of life that works fairly well in our English-speaking Western societies, which is called title. With respect to land title specifically, having title to land enables the owner to leverage the capital in ways that make the land or its owner more productive, and all of society benefits from a successful conjugation of this risk. Even in the event of a default, the unsuccessful idea is flushed down the river, and fresh hands attached to fresh minds have a chance to try to make things happen productively. Shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations. In areas where the authorities suffer from any of the ailments in the previous paragraph, establishing title, transferring title, and perhaps most importantly, leveraging title can be impossible due to the lack of recognition of title the lack of proper records, or it can be a process that is so mired in the above-mentioned ailments that it's so inefficient it's less hassle to swim across the ocean and start a new life in America with nothing. 
than to try to leverage your title to something. In such cases, blockchain can offer a title system that is beyond the reach of those various problems. It can offer a system by which a defined entity can only have a single owner at any given time, and where such an entity may only be transferred voluntarily or by other means which are open source and therefore inspectable. So some corrupt mayor in a tribal area of Pakistan will not be able to confiscate someone's land and give it to his cousin by passing a new bylaw about how many acres of peanut farms are allowed to be owned by infidels. In fact, India and Pakistan could even make good on their nuclear threats to each other and destroy much of each other's intact infrastructure and all of each other's political centers as long as somewhere on earth the blockchain that is still is still running on someone's computer all the little people will still have as legitimate a claim to their little parcels of land as they ever had there are large areas of the developing world which are able to piggyback on the developed world in terms of technological development well, here in the West, we painstakingly erected telegraph poles, transmission lines, etc., over a century and a half. In many places of the developing world, young people are getting high-speed internet and smartphones into their hands before they even have reliable electricity. Many of these people have never heard of a landline, and now they have YouTube on demand. Good for them. I believe that this combination of weak primary and secondary infrastructure along with excellent tertiary infrastructure and a, a technologically literate population will make such intermediate markets in the, I the ideal breeding ground for blockchain-based systems of title, among other innovations. Will the first digital state emerge from the third world rather than Silicon Valley? I don't know. How will such systems of title ever become the system, that is, the system that is recognized above all others? Well, I suppose we could ask the same question about Bitcoin with respect to currency. At the moment, Bitcoin represents about 1-2% to 2 of the entire world's economy. A decade ago, it was essentially zero. What will this look like in another decade? Exactly how much is Bitcoin going to be worth? It will be worth what people are willing to pay for it. For your information, if the entire world's commerce were represented on the Bitcoin blockchain, one Bitcoin would be worth about a hundred million of today's U.S. dollars. There was a project started in 2014 by an enthusiastic Swiss developer named Suzanne Temelhoff called BitNation. It attempted to outline and develop a process for creating digital nation-states. During her TED Talk, she showed satellite images of both her native Switzerland and of Afghanistan, both of them landlocked, mountainous countries, one of them the very holotype of a well-functioning nation-state, and one of them essentially a failed state. She made it clear that some aspects of Swiss nationhood, which made it more functional, such as its high-quality infrastructure, its high level of social trust, and its overall stability, could be exported to nascent digital polities, and that blockchain technology could underrate much of the trust that nation-states typically provide in the same way that open-source blockchain substitutes trust for inspectability with respect to financial transactions. Several of the functions of nation-states, such as issuing passports to vouch for citizens' level of trust, could be provided by such a project. She also made it clear in her presentation that the laws and expected norms of such a nation could be as open or as specific as one likes. She used a specific example of Afghanistan again, if the programmers of a borderless digital nation wanted it to have a modern, liberal approach to life and relating to one's fellow citizen, that may be written into the code itself. Likewise, if another programmer wants to attract people who wish to live by the strictest imaginable interpretation of Islam and to always party like it's 699, they can do that too. Let a thousand flowers bloom and let the free market of ideas attract citizens rather than the accidents of birth her passions for such a project also has a personal history element as her father spent some years as a stateless person unfortunately as of 2024 the project appears to be defunct i hope that brighter minds than my own will take up the mantle there are also darker applications for cryptocurrencies displacing fiat currencies one such concept which is called assassination politics, 
I go into in a little more detail in episode 10, which is about the cast of assassins, of course. How would such a Tao work as a voluntary Gorian political system? Well, there are the pomp and circumstance of elections, Ubar's war chiefs, which colors to wear at the Sardar festival, and rather many other surface-level concerns. These are the type of things that committees do well enough at in existing subcultures, such as the Society for Creative Anachronism, you know, the medieval people, or Board of Trustees for some BDSM-related organization or other. Migrating these over to a blockchain is not particularly difficult. Now let's take a sidebar here. I recently purchased a Tesla-branded car. I know, it's got no soul, but it makes a great local commuter, and I rent it out, and maintenance is rather hassle-free. I had to register it with the local jurisdiction, of course, but I also had to take the additional step of establishing ownership through the Tesla app. The jurisdictional registration handles so much boring stuff as insurance and driving legally. But I look at those papers once a year, unless I'm pulled over in a crash. I interact with the car almost daily on the Tesla app, especially when I'm renting it out. Of course, the problem with things being centralized as they are is that if I got on the bad side of the jurisdiction where I live, they may decide the car isn't mine anymore. And if I get on the bad side of Mr. Tesla himself, Elon Musk, he may decide that the app no longer recognizes me as the legitimate owner and operator of the car. A blockchain-based solution could actually replace, replace both parts of that equation in a way that my title may only be extinguished under the circumstances that I have agreed to, or when I establish, when I establish the title, rather than the arbitrary circumstances that may be decided at a later date by the centralized authority, be it a state actor or car company. Instead, consider the example I went into earlier the non-fungible token that represents the ownership of a particular human being, the aforementioned Busty Blonde Kajira 69. Imagine if she is wearing one of my Treven Forge collars from the future, version 10.0, released in spring of 2030. The non-fungible token of hers, which is now owned by KD1980, in addition to the items listed earlier, also contains the only means of accessing her collar's programming, including the geofence boundary definitions, and the corrective shock capabilities. The caller itself has a QR code that leads to the public side of that NFT, and the private side of that key is hard-coded to the caller's hardware, using an asymmetric algorithm that is easy to confirm, but nearly impossible to defeat. Dystopian science fiction as this may seem, for the people who want to live as gore as gore can be, this could get them much of the way there. I know of one woman who would delight in the knowledge that she would legally belong to a certain someone in a way more tangible than the marriage certificate that's registered with the local jurisdiction. One criticism of DAOs as voluntary replacements for the current conventions of governance and laws is that many people in the same geographical area could essentially be following mutually incompatible legal codes, and that to go outside your house would be to face any number of roving bands of vagabonds answerable to no set of ethics you've ever heard of. As such, it might be wise to remember that the first Christians got the very best lions, and wait for version 2.0. For most people in the West, the current conventions of republics and constitutional monarchies seem to be much more suited to human flourishing and freedom than absolute monarchy, ecclesiastical rule, or laboring under some pharaoh's lash. The Gorian system of voluntary governance and submission, enabled by blockchain to keep everyone honest, would place sovereignty rather closer to home, for the lads into their calloused hands, and for the lasses into the hands of the one who owns them. Is there an appetite for such a Gorian-themed, decentralized autonomous organization, like a borderless digital nation? Living a greater portion of one's life by Gorian custom is an attraction. There is something in the Gorian-tempered man's soul, that feeling of having a loyal title to one's things of recognizing no higher authority over that which one owns, of being ubar within one's home and within the swing of one's sword, which may be better nourished by relating not just personally, but politically in a Gorian social organization, than, say, in the social organization which one is born into by accident. I think there is something of an appetite for such a thing as a Gorian Tao, 
One piece of evidence is that there are already communities which relate to each other in a Gorian style in a video game-like environment. Now, it may be the case that such activity is simply escapism. However, given that unlike in real video games, there are no dragons to slay, princesses to rescue, or to turn out to be in another castle, or races to win, people simply want to be there in a Gorian way, to play village, or play house, or otherwise live out the mundane everyday lives in a Gorian context. I could be under a misapprehension about all this, as online roleplay is not a part of my life. I'm very willing to be corrected, so I welcome comments from people experienced in this matter. We shall see. Thanks for joining me again today. Lasses, don't, net, don't let those knees get lazy. Lads, show her both sides of you. She needs them both, at different times and in different measures. I haven't always heeded this very advice, and sometimes have a hard time discerning which side of me is best for the cultivation of my Ichibandorechan slave heart and deepening of our relationship. After sixteen years, I'm still learning. In a future episode, I'll be taking a much closer look at the concept of caste as it occurs on Gore, caste as it applies here on Earth, and finding a bright side of the concept. However, please join me again next week, where I'll be taking a deep dive into the question of whether one can be religious and Gorian. Until then, fair winds and happy trails. <laughs>